suffrage for women in both 1913 and 1920. Uh, in, in fact, it took until 1923 uh, to even get you know, Delaware to ratify the amendment. We'll get to the Delaware piece in a minute. Um, many states granted women the right to vote prior to the protest, Wyoming being the first before it even joined the nation. Um, and actually that was even part of the concern that they would, uh, you know, coming into the new, coming into the new nation that they allowed women to vote and a lot of other, you know, and that wasn't widely accepted. 12 states did give women the right to vote uh, prior to the protests, but, you know, we still had a lot of way to go. I apologize, I am having trouble sharing my screen, so I'm gonna keep trying, but I'll keep talking so that I don't, uh, let's see if it'll work this time. So I'm gonna introduce you to some of the characters in this story. Um, by, by no means is this all of them, um, but for the purpose of this presentation, uh, where I focus mainly on the protests and the role of some Delaware women in them, uh, these preside a, kind of a good cross-section and a good representation and also do bring up some other issues uh, that, you know, of the type of women that were involved. Generally white women, um, and there was some big issues. Uh, a lot of the Southern support wasn't there because the big fear was that black women would get the right to vote. And that's a problem, was a problem for a lot of people. So again, these, you know, the women that I'm gonna talk about do represent a good cross section, but as I mentioned, they were largely white and women of means, although there is one woman I'm going, that's kind of my favorite that I wanna do more research on. And uh, she will, you know, she will kind of show, you know, show a different side of it. Uh, so several women participated in the protests uh, and sev uh, from Delaware. Seven of them served jail time, uh, including Mabel Vernon, Florence Baird Hills, Annie McGee, Naomi Barrett, Annie Arneal, Catherine Boyle, Mary Brown. And, you know, again, there are more Delaware women that were involved and it's worth, you know, their name, because their names are not known to us in history as many others are. And as I mentioned, while the state level battle is important um, and a compelling story, and a lot of people have done the uh, Delaware, you know, Delaware history, I really like looking at the national, particularly the protests. And I'll mention, of course, certain parts of the state level story in Delaware as, as we need to. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about introducing you to some of the players. Uh, this is someone you may have heard of, and she is one of my heroes, uh, is Alice Paul. Uh, she was one of the main leaders, uh, one of the main strategists of the campaign for the 19th Amendment. And she was the one who initiated along with uh, Lucy Burns, a lot of the protests. And she was, you know, she helped really stage this and make this happen. Okay, let's see, we might be able to get this now. I'm gonna pause for a second, start here. All right, um, they'll be small, but can you see my slides now? Yes. Okay, I'm probably pushing my luck to say. Magic. Okay. Now everybody thinks I'm a complete idiot. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Let's here we are with Alice Paul. So uh, she was born in 1885 in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. And um, she grew up in the Quaker tradition of public service uh, and also the Quaker tradition of pacifism and nonviolence, which are very important to this story. While she was studying in London, uh, she met Lucy Burns, uh, who is a fascinating person on her own, but you know, I really like to focus on Alice Paul and the Delaware women. Uh, Lucy Burns was a fellow American activist, and she became an important ally in this whole struggle for uh, suffrage. It was during her time in prison in England that Alice Paul learned the tactics of civil disobedience 
uh, from people like Emmeline Pankhurst, of whom you may be aware. The British uh, struggle and battle for suffrage did start a bit earlier and um, was very raucous and violent. And, um, you know, when that came to the US, that was certainly a fear of a lot of people. And chief among these tactics that Emmeline Pankhurst and others taught Alice Paul were demanding to be treated as a political prisoner when arrested and also the power of hunger striking. So Alice Paul was arrested repeatedly during suffrage demonstrations while she was in England and even served three jail sentences while she was there. She's considered by many to be the founder of mon modern nonviolent civil disobedience. And this actually served as a model for future movements like uh, Martin Luther King had actually studied her, you know, her tactics and the tactics of what happened in this uh, to inform some of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Uh, Alice Paul earned a PhD in sociology, a master of laws degree, and a doctorate in civil law. It was an extraordinary amount of education uh, for a woman of that time, or even now. Uh, and that, for me as an educator, is certainly worth highlighting. Uh, Alice Paul did pass away in 1977 at the age of 92. Uh, so here's a photo of some of the Delaware women that did, uh, did participate in the protests. And this is them getting ready to head down to DC. This is a photo courtesy of the Delaware Public Archives. Um, and it shows some of the women who participated, again, not all, but you can see that the women mostly all wore white and then they had sashes. Obviously it's a black and white photo, uh, but the sashes uh, had purple and gold. So purple, white, and gold tend to be associated with the suffrage movement. So here we have Mabel Vernon. And Mabel Vernon uh, from Delaware, she was a pacifist also, uh, she was a Quaker, and she became a national leader in this whole movement. Uh, she was a member of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, and she was one of the principal members of the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage, alongside Lucy Burns, Alice Paul, and several others. And she was one of the key organizers of the Silent Sentinels protest. Uh, here she can be seen with the flag where they added uh, one star for each state that ratified the 19th Amendment. Um, and kept, you know, kept adding them as they ticked off states. Mabel Vernon was born in Wilmington, Delaware, 1883. Uh, she graduated from the Wilmington Friends School in 1901, and then she went on to attend Swarthmore College. Uh, she was a year ahead of Alice Paul at Swarthmore, and after graduating, she became a teacher at Radnor High School uh, in Wayne, Pennsylvania. She taught Latin and German. In 1912, though, she attended a convention of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, uh, where she volunteered as an usher. And she actually became the first paid organizer that Alice Paul recruited. Um, and so Mabel Vernon went on to join Alice Paul and Lucy Burns as part of their congressional committee to organize the Women's Suffrage Parade at the 1913 uh, President Wilson's first inauguration. What happened here? There we go. Um, in 1914, Mabel Vernon organizing for the Congressional Union. She traveled all throughout the Southwestern United States and made her way north through California before arriving in Nevada. Uh, she was also considered an accomplished fundraiser, which certainly helped this cause very much. Late in 1915, uh, Mabel Vernon organized greeting parades ahead of Sarah Bard Field, who was driving a petition with 500,000 signatures in support of women's suffrage across the U.S. to be presented to President Wilson in D.C. Uh, as a key organizer of the Silent Sentinels, uh, Mabel Vernon was the one responsible for ensuring that there were enough women there uh, to picket at the White House, and she even organized theme days where women of certain states, certain professions that had gone to certain women's colleges were there. And then she became secretary of the National Women's Party in 1917. 
following the passage of the 19th Amendment, uh, during the 1920s, Mabel Vernon supported candidates, uh, female candidates for Congress, and also lobbied on behalf of the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, I did mention, beginning when we were chattering before we started, that the Equal Rights Amendment has been introduced in Congress every year since 1923. And it was set to be uh, reinvigorated and have Congress extend the deadline for ratification uh, this year, but obviously some other big things have taken, taken the place and the focus of that. Mabel Vernon later went on to Columbia University where she earned a master's degree in political science in 1924. And then in the 1930s, she turned her attention from the women's movement to focus much more on international relations and peace. Uh, she was proponent of Latin American rights and disarmament, certainly because she was a Quaker and pacifist. And she joined the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom in 1930. Uh, she was also a member of the Inter-American Delegation that was uh, the founding of the United Nations, uh, which some of you may know was led uh, primarily, at least in the US, by Eleanor Roosevelt. Mabel Vernon died on September 2nd, 1975 in Washington, DC. She was 92. I think these are imp impressive ages. Um, she was posthumously inducted into the Delaware Women's Hall of Fame in 1986. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next, we have Florence Baird Hills. Um, you know, she was born in 1865 in Newcastle, Delaware, and was the daughter of Thomas Francis Baird. And yes, this is the same, you know, prominent political family in Delaware. She married William Hills, a well-known lawyer in 1898, becoming Florence Baird Hills. And she began her, began her long and dedicated support of suffrage uh, when Mabel Vernon, who we previously met, set up a tent at the State Fair, which was held near Wilmington at the time, in 1914 to rally, rally support for suffrage. And one day, uh, Florence was there, who was showing her dogs, and entered the tent and heard Mabel Vernon's appeal for support, and she was hooked. Uh, Mabel Vernon was able to recruit her, and Florence even donated her car in 1915 and decorated it and named it the Votes for Women Flyer. And she used it to tour Delaware and surrounding areas to really lobby for state level support. So she was active on both the national and on the state level. On a 1916 suffrage tour around the country, uh, she was one of the principal speakers and you can see her in the photo there addressing a crowd. Uh, this is actually a photo in Delaware. Um, and in Seattle, this is one of these kind of amusing little facts that goes along with it. She scattered flyers from a seaplane. Uh, in 1917, she was elected to the national board of the National Woman Party, and she became a member of the National Birth Control League, the ACLU, and the American As uh, Academy of Political Scientists. In the 1930s, 33 uh, 36, she was the national chairwoman of the National Woman's Party and the Seawall Belmont House and National Woman's Party Museum Library is named the Florence Baird Hills Research Library, which is the oldest feminist library in the United States. She founded it because she wanted to make sure that future generations of women were educated on what it took and on women's history. Um, because a lot, still even to this day, a lot of women's history and the contributions of women is left out of general kind of historical knowledge. Uh, Florence did pass away in 1954 at the age of 89, and she was posthumously inducted into the Delaware Women's Hall of Fame in 1987. <clears throat> so here, the next woman, Annie and Nate, she was called Annie Arneal, and uh, she's the short one in the center of this photo. And she's a little different, and this is part of why I like thinking about her and kind of looking at the range of women involved. She was born in Harrington, Delaware, as Anna Melvin, and she married George Arneal of Canada and then was widowed in 1910. 
She was a factory worker. She was not a woman of means. And she lived in downtown uh, Wilmington, Delaware. And she was recruited by Mabel Vernon and Alice Paul uh, for membership in the National Woman Party uh, around 1914. As a member of the Silent Sentinels, she was among the first six suffragists arrested and jailed on June 27th, 1917 at the White House. She served eight jail terms for her protesting between 1917 and 19. She spent, outside of Alice Paul, she spent the most time in jail for a total of 103 days. After one of her arrests, she told the Sunday Star, which was a Wilmington paper at the time, quote, we were good enough to work in the steel plant and help load shells for the battlefields of France, but we are still not good enough to vote, it seems. Can anyone see the justice in this, end quote. Um, yet little else exists of historical record of her. Um, I would love to dive more deeply into her history. I speculate a lot of it is because of her class, you know, being a working class woman. She was widowed and didn't remarry. And she also uh, was married to a foreigner, which, you know, had its own stigma, even though he was Canadian, um, but still. And she didn't really have any family status. She had the shortest life of any of these women. Uh, she passed away in 1924 at the age of 51. So let's look at some of the, the story of the actual protests. So while there were a lot of actions that happened prior to 1917, marches, interruptions of President Wilson's speeches, uh, for the sake of time and focus, I'll keep our story all, you know, as brief as possible, and I'll start in January of 1917. Uh, I'm, January 10th, 1917, the Washington Post uh, warned that women planned to post, quote, silent sentinels at the gates of the White House. This is widely believed to be the origin of the phrase and of the term silent sentinels, uh, because the women, uh, they never spoke and they didn't respond to any taunts or any other attacks. Uh, it was very, you know, they were very focused on being nonviolent. So if you look at the uh, picture in the top left corner, you can actually see some of the women. You know, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? What will you do for women's suffrage? And again, they were right outside there, right outside the uh, fence of the White House. And their goal was to make it impossible for the president to enter or exit without being confronted with the suffrage question. Uh, the president at the time still entered and left the White House through the front gates. Uh, doesn't really happen much anymore. And so these protests drew delegations of women from all over the country, from all the different states. Now, White House officials said the women would be left alone as long as they didn't cause any trouble, because, you know, women are not supposed to cause any trouble and they're supposed to be quiet and womenly and feminine and polite and all those things. Um, so the police initially were very friendly to them. The women kept returning though, every day, regardless of the cold or the rain. And again, the effort to get all these women to keep coming was organized by Mabel Vernon. Yet President Wilson, uh, despite what is sometimes, you know, comes up in videos or history about President Wilson and supporting suffrage, he did not. It took a long time. Uh, he was unmoved by the protesters, even though they were there on the occasion of his second inauguration uh, in March of 1917. But he did give orders that the protesters not be removed by police again as long as they remain peaceful. So Florence Baird Hills led 1,000 women in a grand picket that day of his second inauguration at the White House. At the time, she was the chairwoman of the Delaware branch of the National Woman's Party. She was arrested for her role in this protest. Now, while there were mixed reactions regarding the protest from the public, and there was a lot of negative press coverage, um, criticism of the women really picked up when the U.S. entered World War I. Remember, that also happens in 1917. Many uh, people and the press, et cetera, called their efforts unpatriotic. How could they be doing this? We're a nation at war. Um, and this really frustrated and confused the women 
because they thought what they were doing was highly patriotic, that this was a big deal and this was a big American freedom and a, an American right. Yet this patriotism issue, it really reached ahead on June 20th of 1917. A Russian delegation was set to meet with the president. So the protesters unfurled a huge banner uh, criticizing the president's denial of support on an issue and pointing out the hypocrisy of calling the U.S. a democracy when women could not actually participate in this democracy. Uh, a mob tore the banner down and accused the pro protesters of sedition, of treason. And then when a similar thing happened again the next day, um, the police told the protesters, look, you, you got to move and, uh, or else you're going to get arrested. The women refused to move, so some were arrested. More arrests came in following days as the police got more and more impatient. Remember, they were very friendly at the beginning, but they kind of had enough and they were really frustrated, yet the police did not arrest any of their opponents uh, or anyone that attacked them. The police struggled to find a charge uh, to pin on the women that they arrested and came up with obstructing traffic. That was the best they could come up with. Uh, the women that were initially arrested were, were, were released pretty quickly, and yet the following Monday, they returned with more women and began walking their picket line. The police tried to divert them, so they walked in increasingly large circles around the White House. And later that afternoon, when more and more crowds came, the police clashed with the protesters and arrested more of them. The women who were arrested uh, declined to pay their fines and chose to serve their three-day sentences in the district jail, of which they actually served less than 48 hours. Yet over time, newer jail sentences were much harsher, particularly as the protesters found themselves in front of hostile and unsympathetic judges who sentenced them up to 60 days in the DC area workhouse. So the DC area workhouse, conditions deplorable, worms in the food, women getting sick from the tainted meat and water, the uniforms were thick and coarse despite the heat. Um, there were rats, roaches, other insects. Prisoners were regularly beaten, sometimes even shot. And so, when people started hearing about these conditions, some angry telegrams flooded the White House and President Wilson intervened and the first women, they were released after a few days. Yet, a mob descended on the White House to confront the picketers after uh, uh, they unfurled some banners on August 10th, so we're in August of 1917 at this point. Uh, they criticized President Wilson and equated him with the Kaiser. Violence ensued. A shot was even fired through the second floor window of the National Women's Party headquarters and their American flag was torn down. Yet, police did nothing to break up the chaos and did not arrest any of the attackers. It was made clear though when new jail sentences were imposed, sending picketers to the workhouse, that no more pardons were coming from the White House. President Wilson, you know, had enough of this. Yet from, you know, up through June to October, you know, even though dozens of suffragists were jailed, they still kept picketing the White House, even if they were confronted or mauled by the mobs. So Alice Paul, as we mentioned at the beginning, she gets arrested a lot. She's pretty good at getting arrested. So this time she was arrested and sentenced to seven months in the district jail, which was the longest sentence imposed thus far. And if you look at the picture on the top right, you can see Alice Paul looking out from her jail cell. Um, yet, she was transferred to the psychiatric ward after supportive women start to gather outside her cell window and protest. And you can see some of those women down on the bottom left. Um, you know, we demand that the American government give Alice Paul political offender. Um, you know, ask for freedom for women's not a crime. And, you know, that was causing a whole scene. So Alice Paul, after being transferred to the psychiatric ward, she goes on a hunger strike, you know, something she learned again in England. And yet she was force fed three times a day. This involved putting a rubber hose down her nose, 
while being held down. Also, the door of her cell was taken off and prison bars were installed and the windows were all boarded up so that she couldn't see anybody and no one could know where she was. She was denied visits by her lawyer and a doctor for most of that seven month sentence. On November 14th, the judge sentenced even more women to the district jail, including a six month sentence for Lucy Burns, yet the women were actually taken to the workhouse instead. Uh, the workhouse, the district jail was pretty bad. The workhouse was horrific. And November 14th becomes known as what the night of terror. This is a key thing. One of the women was appointed spokesperson for the group as the others to remain silent in protest. They would not even give their names. They sat on benches for hours and the spokeswoman demanded they be treated as political prisoners. The guards tried to remove the spokeswoman, slammed her head into an iron bed, and as the others rushed to help her, the guards attacked them with clubs, punched them, kicked them, and dragged several women to the men's side of the workhouse. And in those cells, which were horrible, uh, they locked them up. There was no food, there was no water. They could not flush the waste-filled toilets. Uh, and when the women called to each other to make sure they were okay, they were told to be quiet by the superintendent. They were not, of course. And so the guards handcuffed Lucy Burns to the jail bars with her hands over her head. And she was wearing little more than a blanket because she had refused to wear the prison uniform. Finally, several hours later, uh, an aging guard uncuffed her. Uh, and unrest continued at the workhouse. You know, the women refused their assigned tasks. Many more beyond Alice Paul went on hunger strikes and were force fed. Uh, the guards resorted to a lot of violence against them and they were still not recognized as political prisoners. There was finally a trial for the women and challenging their imprisonment. And the hunger striking women, they made this powerful visual spectacle in the courtroom. They were thin, they were sickly. Uh, many were too weak to even sit up or certainly even stand up on their own. And as they were released, the situation began to receive much more positive toward the women coverage in the press and like that this is horrific and people are appalled and we can't believe this is happening. This is the point where President Wilson is finally shamed into giving some level of support. So on January 9th, 1918, after, and now obviously the protests have been going on for a year, Wilson finally announces his support for a constitutional amendment for women's suffrage. With a vote on the amendment, uh, narrowly passing the House of Representatives the next day. Yet, the US Senate refused to take it up till October. So the picketing continued and the arrests continued as well. In October 1918, the president finally appeared before the Senate to urge them to support the amendment, but it failed by two votes. So shortly after that, a group of protesters moved themselves and their banners to the steps of the Capitol, picketing the Capitol when the Senate was in session, and then going off to their office building when it was not in session. So again, that the senators could not you know, come and go without being made very aware of the situation. Uh, in November, uh, the arrest, trials, and punishments of the protesters were finally ruled unconstitutional by a D.C. Court of Appeals. And as we know, the war officially ended November 18th, I mean, uh, November 18th, November 11th, 1918. And in his address to Congress about the armistice, Wilson now urged them, you know, this is kind of time to extend suffrage to women and pass the amendment. And so in December, beginning on the 16th, the protesters started burning Wilson's words and watch fires. These are vigil-like protest exercises, and it's a term and a concept dating back to 1735 or even earlier. And if you look at the picture on the bottom right, uh, you can see the women there, um, and you can see the woman in the center holding up a piece of paper to light fire to it. And these are the women, you know, with the watch fires. These watchfire vigils and protests went on 24 hours a day, 
Women were kept posted there overnight to keep the fires burning, symbolically. And the day before the next Senate vote, which was February 9th, 1919, so here we are in 1919 already, a procession of 100 women with banners, urns, and followed by 26 wood bearers all marched to the White House, where they burned President Wilson in effigy. Uh, 39 were, women were arrested because of this, and 24 of them went to jail. Yet, however, the Senate vote failed by two votes again. New Congress came into session uh, May 19th, and the amendment sailed through the House. Little debate, uh, far more than the required two-thirds majority. Yet, days passed, no movement toward a Senate vote. Um, yet, the vote was finally called on June 4th, 1919 and passed with a comfortable margin. So now we just need 36 states for ratification. 10 months later, 35 had ratified, um, and certainly a lot of credit here goes to state level movements um, that were going on on the ground. So let's look at Delaware for a second, uh, since some of you kind of know or might be aware of Delaware's role in this little piece. Uh, so they looked, the suffragists looked to the Delaware General Assembly uh, to cast a special vote at a session uh, in March 1920, which was called by Governor uh, Townsend to address several issues, uh, which included a vote on the suffrage amendment. There were also school uh, funding and other things being discussed. But he was a highly vocal supporter of suffrage for women. So both sides, the fours and the antis, they descended on Dover, marching through town, wearing flowers. So the suffragists, which were led by Florence Baird Hills, uh, wore yellow jonquils, which are a type of daffodil. And Mabel Lloyd Ridgely, uh, who is uh, the top photo, uh, who was responsible for the Delaware Equal Suffrage Association, also played a key role in uh, this movement in 1920, and she was also highly involved in the state level movement. Now, red roses were worn by the anti suffragists, and they were led by Mary Wilson Thompson of the Delaware Anti Suffrage Association, logical name, uh, and she's down there at the bottom. So, on May 5th, 1920, the Delaware Senate ratified the amendment. Only the House remained to be convinced. Yet months went by, lobbying, rallying. Even Alice Paul made a trip here to Delaware and to Dover uh, to lobby for passage. Yet the House voted to adjourn without passing the amendment, thanks in large part to the political co uh, connections and the influence of Mary Wilson Thompson. So in that moment, Delaware loses its chance to make big history. Tennessee steps into that role. And they ratify it by one vote on August 17th. Um, and as I mentioned previously, Delaware did ratify, but not until 1923. So in the time of these protests from 1917 to 1919, over 2,000 women picketed, 500 were arrested, and 168 served some type of jail time. So, we know in the last hundred years uh, that there has been much progress for women, uh, yet many issues and inequalities still remain, uh, such as the role of women in government. Only about 20% of Congress is female. And as of yet, we still have not had a female head of state, uh, which is rare among particularly developed, but even a lot of nations of the world. Less than 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. Uh, women are disproportionately impacted by sexual assault and domestic violence. Uh, we lack pay equity, and reproductive rights are an ongoing battle. So there's still a lot of work to be done to achieve gender equity, and also in convincing each successive generation why voting is so important and why having your voice heard is so important. And I can tell you in teaching these things, um, that students, again, they don't come with a lot of the knowledge. They don't think their vote matters. And 
I just keep telling them, you know, you need to because people have fought, people have gone to jail, and people have died for this right. So at that point, uh, you can see that there are some photos from some of the previous women's marches um, and trying to get, you know, women's issues re-engaged and getting younger generations involved. So at that point, um, I know I've been talking for a very long time, uh, I would open up if you have questions, comments, thoughts, and I appreciate your uh, patience during my technological issues. So I'm gonna stop sharing so you just see me. I'm here somewhere, there I am. Um, and we'll look over here in, I'll look at the chat and see what we got. Um, yes, a shout out to the League of Women Voters, Sussex County, um, all the League of Women Voters, uh, and you know the we, we, we excuse me, the League of Women Voters also uh, celebrates a hundred years this year. So, um, and a, Carrie Chapman Cat, who was one of their key organizers, was responsible for a lot of the state level movements. Uh, and yes, most of the arrests were simply for protesting, for just being there. And in particular, I mean, there were a lot of protests at the time, you know, there were a lot of nascent labor movements. And so that was common and accepted, uh, but those were men. And this is women and they're there and they won't go away. And uh, that's considered highly unladylike. Uh, to do those sorts of things. We even hear things about women being ladylike. And I remember the comments when Michelle Obama like would show her arms and people were like, how dare she? And how dare she be muscular? So, you know, something, as much as things change, they remain the same. Um, Carol Jones uh, has her hand up. I'm gonna unmute her. Okay, Carol, hi. Um, Carol, you're gonna have to unmute yourself. I think. Unmute. How's okay, that? Carol, I've got you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, a, a quote that's widely attributed, attributed to Mabel Vernon and is in the movie Iron Jawed Angels is that uh -huh. they call us Iron Jawed Angels. Is that supposed to be an insult? Did she actually say that or is that a movie quote? I believe that's a movie quote. They do take some liberties with the. Uh, you know, kind of smoothing yeah. out the story, yeah. although it is a great movie of the story. Um, it they, is. Yes, I've seen it. Yeah, they do. I, I own a copy. I haven't shown it in a while, but I should. Um, but that, I have never come across that quote, uh, but the term did come up at the time, Iron Jot Angels. I'm not, I cannot say definitively that it's linked to Mabel Vernon, yeah. but I wouldn't be surprised because okay. she was pretty awesome. <laughs> it would be. I wish we could find some, uh, uh, you know, uh, information justifying ah. it because it's a great quote. But if it's just from the movie, great as it was, uh, I'm afraid we can't use it, do we? Well, I will look into that one. And yeah. I mean, we can use it as a slogan. <laughs> course it requires you know even more you know but it, it you know it also refers to them being quiet and not speaking up and not you know this the whole silent sentinels thing the idea that you know these women would keep showing up and they wouldn't say anything and they'd be attacked and they didn't fight back and um you know that that was really amazing so that's you know at least where the term comes from i want to see if the quote is hers so yeah. i made myself a note to make sure Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Good to see you. Good to see you. Another great, great show. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Carol. Cynthia. Uh, yes. Uh, I've read, and I, I can't remember exactly which book it was that I read it in. Wilson, towards the end, was, had some disabilities from a stroke. Is that correct or not? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, he actually, there's a lot of rumor and innuendo and as i've looked into uh you know first spouses and such that he really wasn't doing a lot of the leading near the end yeah, that he I'm... yeah that his wife was really essentially being president um and that yeah he was very very ill toward the end but 
you know, much different than how press covers presidents today. Um, you know, whether it's Wilson or FDR or even JFK, uh, they were very careful to not show any, anything that looked like weakness or disability and uh, also not, um, you know, really get into their personal lives. Um, and, you know, whether they had mistresses or other addictions or whatever, that that wasn't, that wasn't proper. Certainly has changed. Oh, yes. Everything is fodder. Everything you have ever said or ever done, if you run for public office. I've said, uh, people have asked me, why, why don't you run for office? And I said, there are things that my mother does not need to learn about me on the evening news. <laughs> uh, let's see. Do we have any other questions? Uh, other questions, comments, thoughts? Comments. I can't believe we have all Large. Yes. Can you hear me? It's Mariah Webb. Yes, I'm Mariah. Hi. Yes. Hi. I just want to recommend to everybody there was a program on PBS called The Vote, and it was on American Experience, and it was all about this whole period of, of suffrage, the women suffragists. It was really excellent. And I got the impression that a lot more um, Black women would have been involved, except for the racism of the white women in the movement. So, you know, I don't know uh, that. Um, comment that uh, Cynthia made about there weren't, you know, there were all these white women. I think there were a lot more black women that supported suffrage. They just weren't allowed to participate. Exactly. And that's kind of, that becomes one of the, I don't want to say dirty little secrets, but that's something that the women's movement has long been criticized for, yes. is not being, even as we got into the 1970s and kind of that, you know, new wave in the ERA and such, that is being an elite uh, white women's uh, movement. So even at the time that was considered, yeah, there were a lot of women that didn't think that black women should be involved or really weren't even considering that this would apply to them because of the racism, the segregation. Uh, but that certainly struck a lot of fear into Southern politicians that, wow, if we give women the right to vote and well, you know, we've already extended it to black men. Uh, now we're going to have black women voting too. Like that, that was just way too much. I mean, you know, obviously decades of work, I say work with quotes, was done to keep, you know, black Americans from voting, but that certainly played into it. And yeah, a lot of the racism and elitism, even having lower socioeconomic class women involved was a rare thing. One, because they didn't have the time, and two, because their issues were different. They're like, yes, suffrage is great, but you know, what about you know, child care, domestic violence, you know, alcoholism, all these other things. Right. Thanks, Mariah. <clears throat> Does anybody else have any comments? I've read, this is Dorothy Dobbin. I've read, um, something connected to um, Harriet Tubman, though, that she, and I remember this from years ago, too, that she was often a spokeswoman at some of the rallies and all, but later I read that, uh, or recently I read that she was actually paid to speak, um, so I wondered about that, if you knew anything about that relationship or um, her role. Um. I don't know too much about it. I know that there were a few prominent black women involved and that, you know, were, but they were largely um, derided by the crowds when they would get up to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so I would have to delve more deeply into, into finding out Harriet Tubman's <coughs> role in it mm -hmm. and in, you know, in suffrage and all the other amazing, I mean, I know a lot of the other amazing things she did, but I would have to look more into that. Yeah, I, I think I read that um, at one of the museums, ever, probably the smaller one over in Cambridge, not the National um, Center, mm -hmm. you know, one of the displays there. So. Hey, I'd like to, hello, are you there? Yes. This Hi. Is, this is Jeff. I want to thank you for your presentation. Well, thank and you, Jeff. I want to recommend something else that everybody should look at. There's a historical documentary called um, Suppressed. Have you seen it? No. Okay, it's suppressing the vote. So it's just like our suffrage movement, and it basically deals with the state of Georgia 
and mm. all of the efforts are done to suppress particularly the black vote. And it's a shockingly true historical portrayal of what's gone on in Georgia all the way up to 2016 and also in 2018 and how people's names were taken off the rolls. So I would suggest all of you, if you just Google uh, historical, um, historical doc, sorry, documentary suppressed. Mm. I'll really? look into that because I mean it's the time to be watching these kind of things right now. Yeah, yeah, and if you look at, I mean, and this is just you know the slice of the national protest for the women, but if you look at any of the expansions beyond white male property owners, twenty one, you know, you think of each of those elements, whether it's race, gender, even you know the removing the property requirement, age, you know, what went into these and the violence and the you know, and things that we look back and go, how, how could you not support this? And and also it, tell, it tells the true story of the, the jelly bean count. <laughs> you know, this, is, this is true. The big bottle yeah. of jelly beans, how many are in there? And if you can't guess the right number, you can't vote. So yeah. go, go watch that documentary suppressed. Yeah, some of the, I've shown and given students some of the literacy tests. They'll say, okay, this was, and I think I actually used one from Georgia at one time. And they're like, what, there are no answers to this. And I said, yes, exactly. These are nonsense questions with no the other, answers. The other great thing that we learned in civics, that for those who are old enough to have had a nice civics course, um, uh, Oh gosh, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, I, I can tell you, I never had civics or American government or anything. I mean, I mean, we had U.S. history. Um, oh, the civics, well, I was gonna say on civics, the grandfather clause. Yes. Now, very interestingly, that was used to prevent blacks from voting after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. But guess what? Had they reinstituted, it would only be the blacks that would be voting. Right, because well, cause because if they all of us, not you know, going back fifty years, it would only be fifty to hundred years. It would only be blacks voting because the rest of us had grandparents. Many of us had were immigrant families. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm a second generation, but all you know, but I have whole sets of grandparents that were not born in the United States. Right, and it yeah, it had much farther reaching. Um, so us. Uh, we have another question James, here. Yes, about uh, arguments against the 19th Amendment. Uh, women were supposed to be at home. They were the homemakers. Um, politics and government were men's business. Uh, it was unseemly for women to be involved. Uh, basically, women were little more than property. Uh, when you married, you became a unit with your husband. Like you couldn't own property. Uh, if the marriage dissolved, uh, generally custody was given to the husband, which is very different than we know it now because women couldn't, you know, they couldn't have means. They didn't have money to uh, take care of children. And, uh, you know, domestic violence was allowed, permitted. And so, yeah, that argument that, you know, this isn't appropriate for women, uh, their husbands will express it, women should be in the home. Uh, it was very unladylike to talk about politics or government, um, even to be, you know, highly educated as a woman. It was, it was very difficult at that time. I know, I know it's hard to imagine, like, how could people think this, but I used to have some of the uh, anti-suffrage arguments uh, hanging on my office door. And I highlighted the one that says, you know, politics is uh, politics and government are men's business. Because, um, you know, being a political scientist, that amuses me. But even the uh, American Political Science Association, I was at a conference a few years ago, and they announced that now 40% of political scientists are women. And everybody was like, yay! And I'm like, really? 40% is as far as we've gotten? Uh, <laughs> So it's, you know, it's, I mean, it's a good milestone, but again, we see even in today, uh, the reactions to uh, female candidates, particularly for higher office, uh, criticisms of female governors, of, uh, you know, female presidential candidates, regardless of your politics. You know, we see a lot of what happened with Hillary Clinton back in 2016. And you know now with uh, Kamala Harris on the ticket with Joe Biden, 
Um, there'll be certainly both gendered and racial. They'll be actually combined into much more horrible things. But yeah, we still, in terms of women being outspoken, women being involved in government, we're still, we still have a hard time with that. Hopefully, hopefully James, that answers that for you. Thank you. Uh, I also thought it was interesting in some of my reading that there were some states that allowed um, women to vote, <clears throat> excuse me, for, uh, school board elections for that type of thing. Mm -hmm. I guess it was, they were considered hard enough to do that. There's a whole map that I have that kind of breaks down the states and um, it makes for a very difficult graphic to see on a small commute computer screen. But it shows, you know, if they extended, if, if they Excuse extended me, but whoever's suffered. dog is barking, could you mute your screen? Okay. I'm sorry, go ahead, Cynthia. That's okay. Uh, that, um, you know, whether they were allowed to vote in local school board, uh, and then, you know, kind of the penultimate was, are you allowed to vote for president in, in national elections? But yeah, there was some very like, hey, maybe if we give them a little bit, they'll kind of, you know, just shut up and go away. Um, and this is really all they can handle because eh, they got children. Maybe they know something about school board. But, you know, national elections and president, that was, yeah, that was a whole other, whole other thing. Okay. Um, Dorothy? wants to know if you will still share the PowerPoint so that I can send it to some of these people. Yep, I'll, I'll send it to you, Marge, so you have the whole thing for everybody. Okay. And, and also, Dorothy, um, we've been recording this, so uh, eventually it will be on uh, the museum's webpage. So you get to see uh, over and over again uh, my technological uh, expertise. <laughs> I do not feel, I, there, there isn't a one that we haven't had glitches. Yeah, my PowerPoint froze for some reason and it just wouldn't come up there, but, but I good. appreciate everybody hanging in. Yeah. So, well, is that, anybody else? Any comments? Any uh, questions? Dr. Cynthia, I just want to say, oh, again and again, uh, Cynthia, how much we appreciate your coming. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me. I, you know, I really enjoy it. And obviously this is a topic in many, many, many other women's issues that, you know, I feel passionately about and talk about. Yeah. Uh, very good. Okay. Thank you everyone thank for you, coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, here's, uh, before you leave, Cynthia, uh, Gwen yes. has posted something you might be interested in. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. And that's, that's a whole, like, the African-American women in the vote and the struggle is, I mean, it's, it's definitely a whole other topic that really deserves a lot of its own examination. Yeah. You know, I only kind of touch the surface, but yeah, that's actually, that, those are both really good sources. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Cynthia, thank you very much. Thank you, Marge. Thank you for having me. And I'll send, uh, yeah, I'll send this over to you later. Okay. All right. You should be getting something in the mail soon. Oh, thank okay. you. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very everyone. much. Bye-bye.